All right, well, tonight we're going to start uh, in the Gospel. I'm about to get used to this clicker. Okay, in the Gospel of John, chapter 3. And where we're going to hit the story, I guess you could say, is Jesus is about, has, about to eat the Passover meal with his disciples. Um, and this meal is just a traditional meal that the uh, Israelite people have. And it's, it's a meal that commemorates some events way back in their history when God delivered them out of Egypt. And so Jesus wants to eat this meal with his disciples. And we're going to kind of jump in in verse 2 of this story in John chapter 3, which is in the New Testament. It's the third or the fourth book. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So there's, there's two ideas in this first few verses that I want you to catch on to. Number one is that the devil is around. right? In this event, the enemy is around. And number two... Jesus is very determined to do what God has called him to do. This is a, is Mark kind of translates this idea in saying that Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. Like there's a determination in him. He understands his purpose. He understands what God has for him. So he gets up from the table and he starts washing the disciples' feet. And he's washing their feet and he gets to Peter. It comes to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you may have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. So what's happening in this meal is there's a power dynamic issue because the students of the rabbi, their job was to make sure that the rabbi had the water, that his food was set out for him, and that his feet were clean. Like that was Peter's job. And Jesus has taken off of his robes and he's going to wash Peter's feet. And Peter's like, look, I didn't bother to wash your feet and we're not, you're not doing that. That's not appropriate. And Jesus says something very key. He says, you're not going to understand this, um, but unless you do this, unless you let me do this, you're not going to have any part with me. Meaning you're not going to be connected to me at all. Unless I wash you, you're not connected to me. So I want you to hold on to that idea. Just kind of think as this story is going. We've got the enemy going there. Jesus is determined uh, to what he's going to do. And Peter, the scene we have is Jesus telling him and basically telling us, if we're not washed, we can't be part of Jesus. So Peter's like, well, wash me completely then. Forget just my feet. Why don't you wash my whole body? And Jesus is like, you've already had a bath. It's fine. You just need your feet clean. This isn't going to clean everybody. He says, but this is like, you just need your feet cleaned, right? This isn't, we're not talking about literal, we're talking about figurative, okay? I'm not quite sure what happened to these slides, because they're off the screen, something weird, but anyway. Um, so, it kinda, so he finishes washing everybody's feet, and he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus says, okay, I washed your feet. I brought myself down to your level, and I cleaned you. I connected you to me. And now what I'm telling you is that you need to do this for one another. This is, a, this is a thing that I'm asking all of you to do. Now, here is the thing. I am dirty, right? I'm not just dirty in that I don't like to take showers. I'm dirty in the, the very sense of who I am. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried this exercise. You probably never have. 
But if you were to write down all of your close family members, the people that you live life with, and then write down your tennis, 10 closest friends, and then went back 15 years and began to write all the bad things that you've ever thought about them, and all the things, the ways you've ever said anything mean to them, and all the things you've done to hurt them, you would be writing and writing and writing and writing, right? I would be writing and writing and writing. We are people of dirt, right? There is a thing about we are broken. I am broken. And like those disciples, I need Jesus to wash my feet. Now, here's the thing about this scene and Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. It's not that Jesus was instituting a literal, we need to wash people's feet every time we see each other. One, that would just take too long. But two, this is something deeper. It, it's something spiritual. Later on in this passage in John 13, in 34 and 35, Jesus says, I give to you a new commandment, to love one another. And this is the way the world is going to know who I am, is when you love one another. right? That's how they'll know you're my disciples. And then Jesus in 1 John 3.16 says, this is how we know what love is, that Christ laid his life down for us. Well, why did he lay his life down for us? Because he forgave us. He took the price of our sin. My argument to you tonight is that this picture of Jesus washing our feet, washing the disciples' feet, is the picture of forgiveness. It is a metaphor for forgiveness, and it is, illustrates how awkward and how intimate forgiveness is, right? And you and I need forgiveness. And it's awkward. I remember early on in ministry when I was just starting out, I was 23, and, and the pastor decided he was going to do a foot washing service, and he wanted to honor me, which I had no idea about, so he was going to wash my feet in front of everybody. And I felt like my feet were gross, and I didn't want anyone touching my feet. Right? So as I figured it out before he called me up, and so I escaped to the bathroom and refused to leave. So there are like 30 college students <laughs> waiting for one of their leaders to come out, and I refused to come out because he wasn't going to wash my feet. Right? Because it was very embarrassing to me. It felt... Like exposing. Well, guess what? When you end up deciding to forgive someone, to step into forgiveness, it's a lot like having your feet washed and washing someone else's feet. So what does that mean then if we're not completely talking about it being something that's literal? So we're in this series uh, during Lent, where we are talking about forgiveness. And we're meditating on Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 to 32. But we began the series by starting at the beginning of chapter 4. And I would like to argue to you that, that the beginning of chapter 4 and the end of chapter 4 kind of represent our feet and what it looks like to spiritually wash one another's feet. Right in the act of forgiveness. So I want to just jump back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, and read it to you and kind of walk through this. It says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. The calling you have received is to wash one another's feet. Right? The calling that you have received is to live a life of forgiveness. How does that washing happen? Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The way that you and I wash each other's feet is that we walk into community together with a knowledge that when you came through that door, and whatever it is, and wherever you are, you came through the door, your job as you look around in this community is to approach people with humility and gentleness. Right? Humility and gentleness, no matter where they're at and how you feel about them, to be patient with them, to bear with them in love. And I love this, to make every effort to keep peace in the bond of the Spirit, right? Keep unity. Washing one another's feet 
in a spiritual, as a spiritual metaphor, well, that's how we wash the first foot, is that we step into each other's lives in this way. Now, we've been walking through this, the last part. You could consider this foot too. But in Ephesians 4, verse 30 and following, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom we, you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, Rod said that grieving the Holy Spirit was saying no to God and saying, no, I'm not going to love other people. So basically, I have no relationship with God and no, I'm not going to be loving other people. That is what gets the heart of God to be broken. When you want to think about how, what makes God sad, when you say, I don't want to be in relationship with you. I do not want to have a relationship with you. God's heart breaks. And then when you go and you look around at the people who love God and you treat them poorly, right? That grieves God's heart. So part of washing one another's feet, walking in a life of forgiveness, is saying, okay, no, I am not going to avoid relationship with God and I'm not going to avoid walking open-handed into a relationship with his people. How do you go about doing that? Well, you get rid of bitterness. Right? Bitterness is a prolonged animosity. It's a feeding, a, a festered wound. Right? And what bitterness is, is you're unwilling to grieve. Right? People in this room, people in other communities who follow Jesus that you've been interacting with, your family, they wound you. And bitterness is when you feed that wound. The way that you get rid of bitterness is to actually grieve the wound. To actually be honest about its pain and to walk through it, not feed it. And the way we often feed our bitterness is through rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. And we summarize that as just quarreling. One of the ways that you and I are called to wash one another's feet is to drop the demand to be right. right? Rod said we have to drop the demand to be right. Because most of us want other people to affirm that we're right, both inside the kingdom of God and outside the kingdom of God. We know we're right. They should all know we're right. And being right gives us power. The invitation to living a life of forgiveness and washing one another's feet is say, no, I don't need to be right. I don't even need to be thought of as right. Not if it is going to remove me from the next line, which says in verse 32, to be kind and compassionate to one another. To be kind and compassionate to one another. Mark last week basically told us that compassion involves empathy. And empathy is not like sympathy, right? Sympathy is when you say, man, I had a hard day, and I said, wow, that must have been rough for you. I'm sorry. That's sympathy. It's useless, right? It's nice that you acknowledge that somebody had a rough day. But that's all you're doing. Empathy says, no, no, no. I've had a rough day. I understand what rough days are like. Tell me about your rough day. Is there anything that I can do to help make your rough day a little easier? What's going on that would make you have a rough day? What kind of problem is it causing in your life? Can I go relieve that? Can I pick up your kids? Can I... Empathy says, I'm going to get into the mess with you, and if you're having a bad day, I'm going to have a bad day, right? I'm going to walk with you in it. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to do this together. We're going to walk through it together. Compassion is being willing to step into someone else's mess and put aside your own. So that brings us back to what we're doing today, which is this next little line. So it says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Next week we will do just as in Christ God forgave you. But for today, we're going to talk about forgiveness. Right? We're going to talk about forgiveness. And we're going to talk about the difficulty of forgiveness. Um, but here's the issue with forgiving somebody. Like, I've been saying this whole time, and others have been talking, that all of you know what forgiveness is, right? That's why it's so difficult. I don't have to give you a definition, but maybe you don't know what forgiveness is, so that's why I wanted to give you the picture of Jesus washing each other's feet. It's a very selfless act, because here's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is the same word, and I've said this before, for divorce. 
right? It's a breaking off, a separating of a union, right? So here's what you're saying when you forgive someone of something. I am breaking my union with the evil that you have done to me, right? You have wounded me, and I have married it. I have married your wrong. And to forgive you, I'm going to break my marriage with that wrong. We're divorced. That's divorced. I have no relation to it anymore. The other definition of forgiveness is that forgiveness, when somebody sins against you or somebody's hurt you, it is a, it's their burden and they carry it. And it's actually heavy on them, even when they're not really thinking about it. And forgiveness is coming along and saying, no, I'm actually going to take your offense and I'm going to remove it like a rock out of a field and I'm going to go throw it out and we're going to hang out in the field and your offense is outside there. Right? But the problem with all of those, with the foot washing and with the literal definitions of forgiveness, is it always puts us in a vulnerable position. Right? Mark talked a little bit about this last week. That when we forgive people, we put ourselves in a position to be hurt again. Right? The invitation, when Jesus washes the disciples' feet and says, love one another, this is the way that people are going to know. And that forgiveness being kind of the essence of what the kingdom of God is, the power of the kingdom of God, is you being willing to forgive, that's a heavy cross. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, it's the cross of forgiveness. It's an invitation into being forgiven, and you can be hurt. Vulnerability is a big part. So I love the beginning of Luke, where Zechariah is singing about God, or about Jesus. Um, and he says this in verse 69, in part of his song, sort of in the middle or near the beginning. He says, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of the servant David. Has he said through his holy prophet a long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Here's the thing, when you forgive people, you are stepping out in vulnerability and you are saying, hey, hurt me again. It's okay, I'm going to make myself vulnerable to that, just like my Savior has made himself vulnerable. But here's what God, through Zechariah, says about Jesus, that he will not allow your enemies to hurt you. He will protect you. He will show you mercy. So what does that mean? Well, he doesn't promise that something won't happen to your body. He doesn't promise that you won't have pain and sorrow and disappointment. What he's saying is is that the God of the universe, Jesus, if you step into following him and you begin the process of forgiving, you, your soul, will not be wounded. There is nothing that anyone can do to the very essence of who you are because you are God's. Right? And that there is nothing that can happen to you in the process of forgiving someone that Jesus is not going to stand in it with you. Right? He's going to stand in it with you. So when you make yourself vulnerable by forgiving others, you are not lost. Jesus is standing with you. Right? Jesus is standing with you. Okay. So who is then the person that we're supposed to offer this forgiveness to, and what are kind of some of the things that are going to come against us. So the person you and I are called to forgive is our enemy. So look around the village. These are your frenemies. Right? These are your enemies. These are the people, your friends in this church, your friends in other communities, they're the people who are going to stab you in the back. They're the people who are going to say hurtful things to you. They're the person who, people who will not come through when you want them to, right? Now, it's not that they aren't going to try. It's not that they aren't going to love you. But it's just, we're humans. 
And there are reasons we need our feet washed. Because we're broken. And we hurt one another. Right? When Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, it's a very fascinating thing. He is washing Judas's feet. Judas is going to betray him 10 hours later with a kiss. He's responsible for the death of Jesus. Jesus does not expose him. He just washes his feet. Peter is going to stand in front of a bunch of people and deny that he ever even knew Jesus. You know, 10 hours earlier, Jesus is washing his feet and they're having this joyous conversation about baths. And now Peter's like, I don't even know who this guy is. Jesus doesn't expose him. You see how, like, Jesus' whole ministry, he knows, is falling apart. All these people who he's washing their feet, he loves them, he's walked with them, they're going to abandon him. Right? They're going to leave him behind. And he says nothing to them. He doesn't expose what they're going to do. Right? He doesn't expose Judas. He offers them a deep intimacy of cleaning their feet and saying, come and be with me, be part of me. He offers them an invitation to be part of the kingdom. But there's one other character in this story, and it's the devil, right? And there's a sense that the devil is just sort of outside the door, that evil, that darkness is outside the door waiting to devour not just Judas, but the disciples themselves. That one of the things that makes it, that when we make ourselves vulnerable in relationship, one of the things that happens is that the enemy begins to come after us because we're vulnerable. Now here's the thing. Satan's offensive and all of his attacks are not in the sex trade. They're not in the drug trade. They're not in any kind of nefarious thing that you can imagine in your life. Evil is already there. He's not making an attack there. There's no offensive there. You know where the offensive is? It's right outside this window. Right? The enemy is waiting to destroy you. Because, one, you refuse to wash people's feet, and two, you're making yourself vulnerable. The enemy wants to destroy us. And he, he's looking for anything. He's looking for your bitterness. He's looking for your unwillingness to be compassionate. You're saying, no, I will not fight for unity. I will not be gentle. There's nothing about me that's gentle. But here's the thing. I think in this picture where Jesus is washing his feet, washing the feet of the disciples, and the enemy is devouring Judas, that there is a picture of what the kingdom of God is like. The enemy is attacking, and instead of Jesus saying no, he says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer you the most intimate thing possible. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to invite you into something bigger while the enemy and death is coming. While the enemy and death is coming. I love this series that we're wrapping up next week on forgiveness. Because it's challenged me in the postures that I hold and the way that I think about forgiveness in this community and in my own life. I really like this picture of foot washing. I really like it. So, as I was praying and thinking, I thought, you know what? I'm going to give my church an opportunity to wash each other's feet. I read a, a story in the process of studying for this about a man who was a racist before he became a Christian. And I believe he was a South African. And his whole mindset, as he talks about it, his whole mindset was to eradicate the African American. That was his, or not just the African, because he was South African. That was his mindset, that they were less. And he found Jesus. And he just, and then he, and he became an Anglican priest, I think it was. And he describes this scene where he sits at the feet of this African American or African priest and, and washes his feet. And as he washes his feet, he begins to just, just pour out his heart for all the things that he's done to this man's people. And all the things that the world has done to this man's people. And this man just starts weeping and weeping. And 
then he says, now it's my turn to whitewash your feet. And he begins to repent over this white man and tell him about all his hatred for him and all his hatred for white people and what they'd done to him and just sobbed and sobbed. And I thought, that's the picture of forgiveness. That's the picture of repentance. That's the picture of what Jesus is inviting us into. And that is what will hold the enemy at bay in your marriages, in your families, in your community. That's what holds the enemy at bay. When you and I are at a place where we can just be like, this is who I am and this is what I've done. And we're in a place where we have to intimately kind of express that by washing each other's feet. Now, so as we kind of, we're gonna, when we go into the time of singing and spending, um, let me have time. Just, it's good. So I'm not going to be disappointed if none of you come up here and get your feet washed. I'll be okay, right? But I felt like I was saying I need to give you the opportunity. And here's how I kind of want it to work. Instead of you just coming up here and waiting for someone to wash your feet, if you feel like you need your feet washed, but you don't feel like oh, I've really there's an offense that I need forgiving from somebody in here, just touch somebody like your wife or your kid or somebody who's close to you and say, hey, would you come wash my feet? Can I wash yours? If you're like, man, there's somebody here I just need to have, I need to wash their feet and say, I am sorry. Like, this is what I've done to you, and this is what I've thought about you, and I just need your forgiveness. Can I wash your feet, and will you wash mine? Then do that. And if this continues to go on, or you feel like, man, during service that feels awkward, but I'd love to do that later, maybe in private, you can pick up the water bucket and the chair and find somebody and go somewhere more private and wash their feet and talk to them about what you need forgiveness for. Um, here's the thing. If you jump in early, the water won't be so dirty. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but here's, here's what I got. I've got towels to dry and towels to wash. Um, the towels to wash people's feet are on the, on the chair. The towels to dry people's feet are on, on the floor. I'm going to actually, we're, since we have some time before we really need to start the music, we're just going to sit in quiet. And if you want to come up and get in wash feet and do that kind of thing, or we just want to sit quietly, that's fine. Um, and then the band will come up and play, and, and we'll be able to do communion and things. So let me just introduce all of those things so we can kind of just let the service move along. But first... On top of all the foot washing thing, if you just need to be prayed for, the healing chair is over there, and you can sit in that, and someone will come along eventually and pray for you. Number two, this is offering. I'm just going to pass this around, and if you'd throw the basket under the last seat, that would be great. Julie will take the clicker. We'll just pass it back. That would be awesome. Offering is just a way that we support our pastors, the way we pay for the building and the electricity and the food. Um, the other way to respond is through c Passover, communion. This is what Jesus was doing. During that meal and all that foot washing, he also took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Took the last glass of wine and said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins, the blood of the new covenant. Take and drink. If you can do those things, if you can take the bread and dip it in the juice and say, I stand with Jesus and his broken body and his blood poured out for me, then please come take the bread, dip it in the juice or the wine, and remember, there is gluten-free bread. So we're going to sit for maybe like five minutes and just quiet, and then the, the meditation music will come on, and then the band will come up and, and spend some time. So let's just sit quietly or have your feet washed.